Our closing session for today is David Cartwright. He's a former real estate partner and current, oh my gosh, okay. There's gonna be a lot of big words here. Um, he's, a former, he's a former real estate partner and cur currently of counsel of, Mc oh my God. Couldn't you work for something simple like Smith or something? Uh, counsel for O. McVelney and Myers Century City Office. David's specific areas of practice, hoping he's gonna actually get it right, areas of practice have included real property acquisition, leasing, construction, land use, public contracts, public-private joint ventures, natural resources, general real estate law. And in his spare time, David is currently board chair, and that's B-O-A-R-D, just to make it clear, currently board chair at the Autry, a position that he has held for a number of years. Over the years, and honestly, several through several Autry directors, David has gently but firmly guided the Autry through his wisdom and passion for the work that we do. He's also handled the merger of the Autry and the Southwest Museum, and he has also negotiated um, the ground lease and construction with the city of Los Angeles and others on behalf of the Autry for our museum. Lastly, he is um, the advisory council for Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of the American Indian. For our closing comments, Marshall McKay legacy and the relationship to California native art, please welcome David Cartwright. What Joe didn't mention is I live in Santa Fe now, actually. Um, there's gonna be some slides up here that are totally disconnected with my comments. They're just gonna happen as I understand it. <laughs> and that's a good starting point. I'll try and abbreviate some of these remarks, but I, it's going to be a little lighter from my standpoint. I'm calling this home by the spring water. I've known Marshall for 20 plus years, but I know him in the context of the Autry. And so the remarks I'm going to give you are going to be some stories from Marshall and the Autry. Born in 1952, passed away over the Christmas holiday in 2020, my predecessor as board chair. He served many years on the Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation Tribal Council frequently as chair. There's a long list of organizations and causes that Marshall led and promoted. I refer you to the internet for that. You'll find these connections truly amazing for any individual who seems so intentionally always trying to avoid the limelight, preferring instead, as he would say, to just get on with it. I don't intend to speak to this lifelong biography at all, important as it is in my memory and probably your memory. I have another agenda, but at let me at first give you a few of what I understood to be, and I believe were Marshall's longstanding interests, land conservation, agriculture, as an economic lifeblood, the Cash Creek community and its surrounding territory, gaming, hotels, golf course, economic sustenance, Patwin language preservation and revitalization for what is our past without our language. Respect for traditions without sacrificing the need to address and accept the modern. This is truly uh, exceptional because Marshall's support for contemporary native art and tribal economics is sort of reflected in the baskets of Mabel McKay and her legacy is central to understanding Marshall, I believe. The identification of cultural resources, the relentless promotion of education at every level. And that includes many of the projects he launched at UC, UC Davis. That includes the so-called STEM subjects, veterinary, medicine. Marshall was kind of everywhere and everything sharing economic benefits throughout the surrounding communities in Yolo County, the state and the nation. 
where once the Ochadihi were the object of shameless and mostly violent attacks from immigrating groups, from missions to the Gold Rush, to the Dawes Act and beyond, sometimes against all odds, survival and strength and the projection of a unique voice that refused to be silenced, that was Marshall. Finally, there's no list that can be complete without saying that Marshall was the conduit, maybe more like the enforcer of promises made by ancestors to future generations and the obligations of the present generation to the past and future. That was Marshall the teacher who always reawakened memories as lessons. But where did this man come from? I can't claim a fraction of the knowledge about Marshall that you all have. I can't and won't compete on that subject, but please send me your stories. I'd love to hear more and you'll hear a few from me. Home by the spring water, that's where Marshall came from, along with all of the Yochadihi Wintun people from ancestors to here and I now. His family life was complicated, like so many of our own family lives. There are intersections and diversions and divisions. But we do know that Mother Mabel McKay raised him and that art and culture were always near, even if his working life was spent assisting the US Defense Department. Many years ago, when the Autry was merging with the Southwest Museum, several critics argue, argued that the dominant cowboys were fighting the Indians again and the cowboys were still dominating to which Marshall responded in feigned anger and a smirk, wait a minute, my father Charlie was a cowboy. And I guess he was. That says a lot about Marshall too, a man of contradictions, but that isn't the right word here. His lifelong work set a pattern. He lived at the edge. And by that I mean where the convergence of culture dominates the separateness of our individual lives. He was in a word interconnected. He divide, defied and challenged the cliches and the petty prejudices of the past, which have leaped or leached into our present. Out there in the audience, you no doubt have many examples of this Big Ten approach from Marshall which inevitably leads Marshall to a humorous event or outcome, one of which you might find yourself being pulled into intentionally or unintentionally. I will give the Autry examples. A dinner on a mountain outside of Juneau, Alaska. During an offsite meeting of the Autry's board of trustees, the de dinner devolved into a crab eating contest instigated by Marshall. A carriage ride with Marshall and some of the other trustees, all cigar smoking, along with Jackie Autry, where the fumes inside so consumed us that Jackie paid the poor driver a substantial sum for the fumigation after we departed. <laughs> a wagon tour of Canyon de Chez, put together by then museum CEO John Gray, during which Marshall, led the dialogue with the Navajo guide, with Marshall asking leading questions about ancestral Puebloans that originally settled that canyon, until the guide was exasperated and finally gave up and said, hey, I'm Navajo. We came to this valley later when everyone else was gone. <laughs> <laughs> An honest answer to be sure, with Marshall adding something to the effect of, well, you have a history too. And that was Marshall. Another episode in Navajo country where several of us were really interested in the beauty of Navajo weavings, perhaps as buyers. But we were frustrated that so many of the trading posts seemed to feature, I gotta be a little careful here, something of the lesser arts. Marshall interjects, you have to ask them about the back room. It's always a back room. And that's where the good stuff is. You tourists only see the surface. And sure enough, Marshall asked, and we were led to the back room, the upper room and similar rooms at other trading posts, and we were overwhelmed with what we were shown. Marshall, as always, was a buyer. The lesson of that story, 
you have to ask. In another trustee episode, we were on the expedition from Durango to Chaco Canyon, traveling to meet Zia Pueblo leader Peter Pino, Peter Pino for a tour. Someone at the Autry had contracted for a bus to take us there. As it turned out, that bus was outfitted to be a cross between a high school prom after party and a Vegas casino private room. <laughs> if you've been to Chaco, you know how bumpy that road is. Marshall, Sharon, and their trusty entourage were in the back. Our Autry CEO was sitting in front, mortified at what was going on in the back. <laughs> Some very lively interaction and loud commentary culminating in the air conditioning unit collapsing onto Sharon's head. She was not injured, she's here today to prove it. And while the rest of us fell into the aisle after a particularly big jump, when all the wine glasses that we weren't drinking from fell and smashed on the floor, Marshall, as always, was in the middle of it. You can only imagine the commentary. At the Santa Barbara mission, on a tour of the inside, when the guide mentioned the spiritual quality of the sanctuary, Marshall whispered, I can hear the voices crying out now. <laughs> but, but that whisper reverberated loudly against the stone of the walls, and the voices did cry out, much to the consternation of the carefully curated history tour of that place. Marshall was always a proponent of developing immersive experiences as part of the museum programs. One interesting, albeit very dark idea of his was called the boarding school bus. The Autry, he said, could consider bringing school kids in for a museum immersive experience. They would be loaded onto the boarding school bus outside given proper uniforms to wear, and then told, forget about what you know and who you love, you're off to a new school, and you'll never see your families again. <laughs> Needless to say, the museum did not adopt this recommendation. <laughs> but the import of Marshall's suggestion was not lost on the rest of us, hearing that comment. The stories could go on and on, and most, many of them I can't actually repeat because there is certainly going to be offensive to some. But that was Marshall. He was um, unrestrained, but he did it in a manner, I think, that all of us would agree was always friendly. There was a, could have a smirk, a smile on his face when he said these things. To sum up, Marshall believed in the innate ability of people to tell their stories in their own voices, as actors in their own dramas about events and experiences which were uniquely important to them and which were part of their destiny. This he believed was strictly, was particularly true for native artists and contemporary artists, like those of you in the audience. Though the list is long and the genres and methods are many, there are some key artists that Marshall mentored, sponsored, encouraged, found buyers for, some of whom, many of whom are in the audience, for Marshall, it was not enough to just befriend and give abstract support. It was also important to bring economics to artists, and that means buyers. Developing and expanding audiences for contemporary Native art required connecting multiple different cultural worlds, and that is a task Marshall was really well suited for. Let me name some names of these artists and women, men and women that Marshall considered inspired. Some of your names are out there. Tony Abeda, Doug Hyde, Kathleen Wall, Mateo Romero, Robert Dale Sosi, Doug Coffin, Clint McKay, who I have, I have to meet Clint now because I've never met Clint before. And uh, Marshall has long mentioned you many times to me and I always wanted to be able to meet you. Um, the late Harry Fonseca, Cliff Fragua, Leah Matafragua, Frank Lapina, Kathy Elkwoman Whitman. There are so many more, and as I said, I have met, not met most of you. I would have hoped over time to meet you, but 
I always wanted Marshall to be the inter intermediary because he was such a good intermediary. In Marshall's words, for me, the significance of keeping our stories, art, language, and culture alive is personal because it is central to our own survival as a people. It reflects the promise we have made to generations of storytellers and culture keepers, the promise that we will carry the knowledge of our traditions on into perpetuity to preserve the core of who we are as Native people. And then there are some of the people Marshall considered friends and confidants, effectively adopted family members who crossed the boundaries of art and emotion into extended friendships and more. People like Della Warrior, Anthony Pico, Clint McKay and Doug Hyde for sure, Rick West, Sharon Rogers McKay, an unofficially adopted son, Alexander, with whom Marshall felt strong family bonds as with the other rest of Sharon's uh, family. I know there are many more family members and friendly friend names who have passed, and I don't know them all. And I don't know all of you yet, but I feel after two days of this that I know a lot of you much better. Let me briefly recount the story of one of those friends who is in the audience, Rick West. When Rick became the CEO of the Autry Museum, when most people thought maybe he was going to rest on his NMAI retirement laurels in Washington, we had a different idea. Marshall had been the board chair of the Native Arts and Culture Foundation, and there was a conference, I believe in Seattle, which is was being attended by Rick West as well. Rick, you may have been speaking. Marshall, knowing that the position of Autry CEO was about to become available, tracked Rick down in a corridor of a hotel during intermission. Without going into detail, Marshall and I conspired to feed Rick perhaps overly enthusiastic financial projections. <laughs> they weren't really lies, they were just... <laughs> I mean, I did feel a little bad, but... Marshall said, get over it, get over it. <laughs> the rest is history. Carpe diem was another trait of Marshall. Seize the moment and don't let it escape. We didn't let Rick escape. <laughs> he would probably not have accepted had we gone the traditional route, but think of that as the contemporary route to getting Rick at the Autry. Who could res resist Marshall's squeeze? Marshall and Sharon were first introduced to the Autry by Joanne Hale. Jackie Autry, who is herself somewhat of an authority on native basketry, adored the work of M Mabel McKay. Later, Autry CEO John Gray, with Jackie's wholehearted support, brought Marshall and Sharon onto the Autry's board. Marshall, in turn, brought the honored tradition of cigar smoking to trustee retreats. More important, he brought a teaching moment that as one could not understand the history of the West or the culture of the West without Indian history and culture being at its center and contemporary Native art being its Holy Spirit. Marshall was a listener before his advocacy, a conciliator before supporting a cause, a teacher rather than a lecturer, a voice for tolerance first and ask questions later, a friend first. Unassuming and without the condescension so often associated with powerful and influential people, a builder of bridges someone who did not flinch from memory, irreverent and with a sense of the ironies of modern times when measured against the often desperate and destructive events of the past. And in the end, someone who cared deeply 
and never forgot the things that really mattered. Quoting the Yochadihi Tribal Council on Marshall's passing, may Marshall be warmly welcomed by the ancestors he sought to honor. Thank you for listening. Welcome to the Autry as we move on into the reception. And I really have had a great two days. I don't know about the rest of you, but clap for yourselves. Thank you, David, for that very moving presentation. And thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. There's been some great sessions over these past couple days, which gave us a lot to think about. I'd like to thank all the presenters coming. Uh, I'd like to thank all the presenters for coming to share your knowledge with us today. I'd like to thank all the Autry staff that made this happen. Keep in mind that the papers from this seminar, both yesterday and today, we published in a journal that should be available in the coming months. This is our first seminar that was organized in honor of the late Marshall McKay. Next year's seminar, we'll dive deep into our important collection, focusing on Native American baskets, which means, Clint, I'm sure we'll see you again. As a reminder, there will be a reception in Heritage Court, which is through the museum, down the stairs, immediately following this seminar. Lastly, Marshall, our friend, brother, relative and elder. Thank you for inspiring us every day. Thank you. <laughs>